Welcome back to all new featured guests. I'm your host, Vanessa Rodriguez, and today joining me is Katie Little. She's a director at advancement from the Community Coalition Against Human Trafficking. How are you today? I'm good, how are you? Good, okay, to start off, can you tell us what the Community Coalition does for counter trafficking in East Tennessee? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Community Coalition Against Human Trafficking basically um, works to end modern day slavery in our community through four main initiatives. Um, we work to raise awareness in the community, um, basically telling everybody and anybody who will listen um, about human trafficking and what it looks like here and what we can all do to stand against it. Um, we train primary responders, so that includes law enforcement, but also folks like emergency room workers or cable TV installers or truck drivers. Um, anybody who's really on the front lines and has the first opportunity to notice something suspicious and report it. Um, we oversee a locally focused task force, which is pretty cool. It's made up of representatives from law enforcement and direct services agencies here in Knoxville and Upper East Tennessee and folks from um, U.S. Attorney's Office and DA's Office and a whole slew of agencies and we basically all come together and talk about how we can better collaborate and work together to fill the gaps in service provision for survivors and prevent this crime and ultimately put an end to it in our community. Um, and then ultimately we also serve survivors of human trafficking right here in Knoxville and East Tennessee with um, wraparound aftercare services that will help them um, kind of come out of their crisis situation and ultimately um, heal and work on that road to recovery and become self-sufficient. Well, that's amazing. Can you tell us a little bit more on how human trafficking is becoming the second fastest growing criminal industry right behind drug trafficking? Like, how is that possible? So I think uh, the thing about human trafficking is that um, unlike selling drugs, it's mm -hmm it's high profit and low risk at the same time. So, um, you know, when you're selling a person, you can sell that person again and again and again. Um, you can sell a bag of drugs one time. Yeah. And so it's high profit, it's low risk. If you have, you know, a man driving down the road who gets pulled over and he has a bag of drugs in the trunk, he's going to jail. There's no doubt about it. But if he has a girl in the front seat mm -hmm. next to him, it's easy to explain that away and it's easy to say, oh, she's my sister or she's my friend or my girlfriend. And, you know, if the woman sitting in the front seat is either afraid or if she's been told to lie, mm -hmm. um, then it's easier kind of for that to fly under the radar. And I think the thing about human trafficking is that traffickers aren't stupid. They're mm -hmm. master manipulators. And sometimes, you know, they mess up and that's, that's what allows law enforcement to catch them, but ultimately they're really, really good at exploiting and manipulating other people. And, and you know, um, I think in addition to that, it's a demand-driven crime. I think as long as um, there is a demand for cheap sex or pornography or labor, we're always going to be driving this industry yeah. up. So. But human trafficking, like people don't realize, it's happening in our own backyard. More than 100 human trafficking cases were reported in just Knox County in 2015. So why are people not aware of it? Like, do you know why? I think that's a good question. I think, you know, just in the past seven years since the coalition mm -hmm. was founded, I think um, as a community, we've all done a really great job of learning more about it and how to recognize and report potential cases. But I think, um, for a lot of us, the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about trafficking is Liam Neeson and the yeah, Taken, Taken movies. <laughs> yeah, and so I think, you know, it, it, because of that, I think, and because a lot of how we talk about it is on an international kind of basis, I think that it's easy to look at that and say, yeah, we know that's happening in the world, but it's not happening here. That doesn't happen in suburbia in Knoxville, yeah. Tennessee. It happens in Thailand and China and mm -hmm. India and all of these other countries that are worlds away from us. But really, you know, um, it does happen right here. And I think the hard thing about awareness is, is like you said, kind of getting to the heart of it's in our backyard and it's happening to people who are from Knoxville and from East Tennessee and who have grown up here their whole lives. And so um, by gaining kind of more partners 
in these past seven years in law enforcement and direct service agencies and even folks in the community. A lot of students here on campus have been great advocates for this and, and raising awareness. I think that's taken us really far in the past few years. And people are now, like you said, are starting to like become more aware. What do we need to know if we see something suspicious, like what are the things we should be looking out for? That's a great question. I think a lot of times, um, well, first, one of the big things to know is that it spans demographics and socioeconomic classes. There's not one particular profile. Um, really anybody with a weakness that can be exploited is someone who can fall victim to this. And so um, oftentimes we'll tell folks to look for, you know, if you notice someone who uh, is perhaps always with another person or their movements seem to be controlled or they are often getting caught in a lie about about something. Um, I think especially too when you see teenage girls, younger girls, sometimes if she has an older boyfriend who's buying her really expensive things and um, you know kind of taking care of her in a way a guardian almost would, mm -hmm. um, that's certainly a red flag. We see you know if you notice someone who has injuries, bruises, cuts in multiple stages of healing, mm -hmm. which indicates abuse over a long period of time. That's certainly something that can be an indicator, as well as substance abuse, mental health issues. Um, if you notice someone who has been wearing the same clothing again and again, maybe they have little to no belongings with them, just maybe a backpack or just the clothes that they're wearing. Mm -hmm. um, all of those are really good signs and red flags to watch out for, and we also on our website have a lot of great resources and the numbers that you can call to report these things to if you do notice something suspicious. Um, and even if it's not human trafficking, if you notice something weird, it's probably weird, whether yeah. it's domestic violence or child abuse or what have you. And so it's always good to report, um, even if you're unsure. We usually have good intuitions. If you feel yeah, weird, if like, you feel weird, yeah, definitely report it. Report it. So how's the coalition trying to change people's mindsets in regards to victims of human trafficking? Well, here in Knoxville and in Upper East Tennessee, mm -hmm. um, it looks a little bit different, I think, than perhaps it would in places like New York or um, you know some of those coastal, bigger city areas. In um, the rural areas, sometimes what we see is mom and or dad oh. selling their children out of the home for drug money or to pay the bills. And sometimes it's because maybe mom's mom did that to her and it's a normalized behavior. Um, of course in the city it looks more like prostitution. Yeah. A lot of times the question that we are asked is, well how do you tell the difference between a prostitute and a human trafficking victim? Mm -hmm. And that's tricky because really hum like sex trafficking is really just forced prostitution. And so there are two sides to the same coin. Mm -hmm. And I think that's tricky because when our view of human trafficking survivors is Liam Neeson's daughter yeah. <laughs> being taken, um, then it's unexpected to see someone who looks like a prostitute with a criminal record mm -hmm. and substance abuse issues and think of that person as a survivor of trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one thing that we really want folks to know about the survivors that we serve is that, you know, breaking down those, like, the stigmas that we have against prostitutes. Um, as a culture, I think we do not so great of a job of um, when we talk about who's responsible in prostitution situations, we don't really blame pimps or purchasers of mm -hmm. sex as folks who are doing something wrong, especially in the media. It's looked yeah. at as something that's kind of, you know, glamorous or glorified mm -hmm. and prostitutes are always seen as the criminals and the folks who are dirty and, you know, I think if we can shift that cultural mindset, then that would really go a long way to support survivors. Try to community. have like equal responsibility is Absolutely. not just leaning to one way. Mm -hmm. um, to finish off, can you tell us more about how Grow Free Tennessee and their new residential facility for adult sex trafficking survivors? Yeah, so Grow Free Tennessee, um, we just launched that brand within our organization at the first of this year, and we're really excited about it. It's actually, um, that is the direct services arm of our agency. So the coalition is still alive and well, and Grow Free Tennessee is what we are referring to as the direct services piece of that. Um, it's much more trauma-informed and client-centered um, than, you know, when you first interact with a client and 
you're saying work from the counter trafficking agency that's not very <laughs> sensitive <laughs> to everything that you know they're they've experienced and what they're coming out of so um, we will be opening a safe house at the first of 2018 we're in the process of purchasing the property for that and getting that all ready for survivors here in Knoxville it's going to be the only safe house for survivors of human trafficking in the Upper East Tennessee area so we're really excited to be able to finally have one centralized location where survivors can get the care they need. And what do you think the su survivors like will think about the safe house? Um, like the reception? Of yeah, I think, I think, I hope <laughs> that it'll be exciting. I think it'll be a relief in some ways mm -hmm. just because um, the way things are currently working because there's not a centralized location where they can be safe and have a home. Um, it's hard to piece together wraparound services because if you don't have anywhere to live while you're yeah. getting counseling and drug treatment and legal advocacy and all these things, then all of these things break down because ultimately you're not in a safe place and you have nowhere to go. And homeless shelters don't do the job and domestic violence shelters, you know, it's good for a short-term solution, but in the long term, you know, it takes a long time to even begin to recover from mm -hmm. all of this trauma. and so. Our hope is that survivors will feel like finally they have a home to come to. Well, Katie, thank you so much for coming on the show and it's something that's super important and wonderful that the coalition is doing. And I'll see you guys next week.